Welcome back to The Torch, everyone. I'm Jake. And I'm Kimberly. And today our guest is Dean of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences at University of Arizona, Shane Burgess. Thanks, Jake. Welcome. Glad to be here. Thank you, Kimberly. Really thrilled to be here. So I'm going to read your bio because it's very impressive, but I'm not going to read the entire thing because we would like to talk more with you about your amazing qualifications and your history. Um, But just to give our listeners an idea, a native of New Zealand, Dr. Shane Burgess has worked around the world as a practicing veterinarian and scientist. His areas of research expertise include cancer biology, virology, proteomics, immunology, bioinformatics, and computational biology. Dr. Burgess is currently vice president for agriculture, Life and Veterinary Sciences and Cooperative Extension, Dean of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, and Director of the Arizona Experiment Station at the University of Arizona. That's quite a title. It is. It is. <laughs> See, we're done with the interview now. That's, yeah. not, that's not even the whole thing. That was 45 minutes. Now right? we're done. Well, so just to tell folks a little bit more, he spent the first half of his professional career working around the world as a professional veterinarian and scientist. He joined academia in 2002 as an assistant professor at Mississippi State's College of Veterinary Medicine and joined the University of Arizona in 2011. He is focused on preparing U of A students to be leaders and job creators, enabling researchers to find solutions to today's biggest challenges, and bringing the science of the university to the people of Arizona. Welcome, Dean Burgess. Thank you. I appreciate (laughs) that very much. Well, there's one thing I just wanted to add, and that is, I think, it's very relevant to this meeting today, and that is, from 1989 till till 2002, um, I was actually in the private sector. Okay. And, and I actually did my PhD while I was in the private sector. So people say to me, well, is it like a grad school? And it's like, I don't know. I didn't go. <laughs> I spent about, I think it was about 16 hours total. Obviously, doing a PhD, you have to do one through a university. And mine was through Bristol University Medical School. Mm. Um, but I did that while I was working in the biotech world. Uh, and then uh, and then, um, then the organization I was working for sold my PhD for about a million dollars. And that's what funded my next job. Oh, so, wow. So... It's not that common, especially in the United States, to do PhDs that way. But uh, mm-hmm. so I've always had the strong connection to the private sector, and mm-hmm. for other reasons too. But so, uh, and I got my people can probably tell by now that I wasn't born in the United <laughs> States. Uh, and uh, so I got my I got my vet degree in New Zealand. So, wow, where I grew up. Wonderful. So actually, our first question is: talk about your upbringing and your childhood. We love to know a little bit more about people's origin stories. Yeah, right. I think people's origin stories are really important. They set a foundation for what people are and who people are and how they think. So I grew up in New Zealand. Uh, I traveled around a lot. I had a lot of different schools growing up. Um, grew up in a in very much working class family. I'm a first generation student. That means that uh, none of my none of my extended family went to university. So. Um, and uh, I grew up, um, growing up in New Zealand, it's a country about twice the size of Italy. Um, mm. It's incredibly um, lowly populated. There's, uh, the time I grew up, there was, uh, uh, and maybe still now, there was less people in the whole country than there are in the metro Phoenix area. Wow. So, um, so imagine the you know, Phoenix c- competing with everybody else in the Olympics. That's what it would be like. <laughs> so uh, there's kind of a joke in New Zealand that we're really good at sports you can do sitting down. So we're really, <laughs> really good at rowing, shooting, archery, um, sailing. Anyway, so I grew up in, on, and under the water. So I originally wanted to be a uh, marine biologist, but, mm. but Jacques Cousteau wasn't hiring. Plus I came, <laughs> plus I came from a really blue-collar family. And so you, know, you went to university to get a job. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other thing is uh, my mum's Australian, my dad's New Zealander so we always had this kind of outward focus to the world mm-hmm. and uh, of course if you look on a map um, it's a three hour jet flight to the nearest country over water Wow! so it's like uh, you know, like us going to New York it would be it would be that's that's what it takes to get to the nearest country mm-hmm. and so uh, also massive massive um, export driven economy about 99% of the economy is exports Put that in context, in the U.S., about seven percent of the economy is exports. Wow! So, uh, and so when I grew up, we had one trick, and that was agriculture. And uh, so, when when the U.K. joined the European Commission at the time, um, overnight we just lost our export market. So, it went to this massive recession. Um, it was the first of a number of recessions I, I grew up understanding. But it was that agricultural recession which drove New Zealand to diversify. Well, it doesn't have energy resources. Uh, 
And so what did they do? Well, that's, the, that, that's what created bungee jumping in the New Zealand wine industry. Mm. So they looked around. They said, what do we got? And it's very similar to what I think we've got in Arizona. Mm-hmm. We've got all this natural beauty, all these natural resources, nobody to contaminate or to use it up. Why don't we sell it? You know, big problem, though. It's a 14-hour plane flight from Japan. <laughs> Right, oh, yeah. <laughs> so you still got to get people to come here. But anyway, that's that's why we had all these innovations around uh, using the natural environment and health and nutrition and sports. Um, so then, when I graduated, went through another recession overnight. Um, uh, when the government released this budget, um, at one minute to midnight, they said, "And by the way, on the budget, the Westminster democracies, we all have budgets where we have a finance minister or a treasurer, mm-hmm. and uh, what they do is they they release a budget twice a year." Uh, the, the little budget is released at the six-month mark and the main budget is released at a year. And they read it out and they start at 9 o'clock at night. And all the non-controversial things are in the early stages. Sure. And they talk about smoking taxes or whatever. And then the really controversial things are one minute to midnight. So one minute to midnight they said, and by the way, um, all farming subsidies will be cut as oh. of tomorrow. So at that point, 25% of New Zealand's dairy farmers went broke. Wow. Oh, man. And so it was pretty brutal. Um, but that is what led to the enormous uh, powerhouse that is uh, Fonterra, the dairy company, the major mm-hmm. ex- export dairy country. And, of course, people may not know this, but Arizona is a, is, is a dairy state. Mm-hmm. Dairy is a big deal. I mean, dairy farmers are really suffering. Till I was 24, dairy cows paid my way. Wow. Uh, so when I was in practice, I, I graduated at 22 as a DBM. And, and, and uh, when I graduated, there were 64 people in my class. 61 of us left the country to get work. So I know what it's like to be an economic migrant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the reasons I've worked in five different countries. So, um, you know, I had to leave the country to get work, and so did did, did 60 of my colleagues who graduated from vet school. So so we're very focused on the economy there. We're very focused on uh, the fact that, uh, especially if you grow up blue-collar, neither of my parents left high school. I mean, graduated from high school, Mm -hmm. obviously left high school, didn't graduate. Uh, Dad was a dairy farmer. He was one of the ones that went broke when the EC happened, um, European Commission happened. And uh, um, so we're very aware of recessions and and uh, making sure we get people jobs. I'm personally very aware of first-generation students and, mm-hmm. and what it means to go to college and not have a family who understands what college is about. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, very aware of economic migrants, so what it means to be an economic migrant. Um, yeah, I'm proud to say that uh, that I'm an American now by choice. And I would say if anyone's never seen it, uh, get yourself down to an immigration ceremony, mm-hmm. a citizenship ceremony, and see what see what people have gone through. Uh, I did mine in Memphis, Tennessee. Oh. And, uh, yeah, I got up early. To, uh, my wife's an American by birth. Uh, and uh, so and I said, I, I, we had to, I had to get up at 4 in the morning to go to the ceremony. Wow. And so I said, I just the, the kids a little. And she said, no way are, we, are, we, are you going by yourself to this. We, we're going to be there. So we were in uh, Mississippi, had to drive to Memphis, northern Mississippi, had to drive to Memphis. Uh, my father-in-law was in eastern Tennessee. He drove, he, sh- he left work, stayed overnight, halfway, drove to Memphis, and wow. he, wa- he wanted to see it. So when I did my citizenship ceremony, I was the only person in about 50 who had an intact family. Wow. So it really is meaningful. No, mm-hmm. Not a dry eye in the place. Mm-hmm. Anyway, we left the ceremony, f- started at 8, finished at 10, and uh, we were in the parking lot. And uh, my wife's family celebrates everything by going out to some restaurant, right? And it's, it's a good town for food. It is a great Memphis. town. It is a great town for food. But I've had a lot of time with my wife's family going out to restaurants. <laughs> so, well, good barbecue. Hopefully that you got. Uh, well, yeah. And, and every state, of course, has barbecue, right? And right. Everybody's has the best. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, we're in the parking lot in Memphis, and uh, and so I said, uh, you know what I want to do? I want to go see Elvis's house. Graceland. I was hoping you were going to say so, that. So first two hours as an American, I, I spent in. Graceland. Wow. So. That's quite Probably the American one of, dream. One of the most American things. <laughs> anyway, so that was that kind of a long-winded introduction. But uh, <laughs> but anyway, yeah, that, that's that's the base of my story. That's a great story. Very yeah. cool. Thank yeah. you for sharing. Just to go back a little bit, you you left New Zealand at 24 having no, worked No, I was 20. I just turned 22. My first job was building fences in the West Australian Desert. Oh, wow. Because I didn't have any money. And yeah. so I moved from Australia to New Zealand to Australia, partly because I feel at home in Australia because my mum's Australian. Partly I had friends out there. And, uh, yeah, so the first job I could get to feed myself was to, to dig post holes in the West Australian desert. I want to know what that feels like, Ty, digging a, digging a post hole in asphalt in, in <sighs> concrete. So we had an auger on the back of the tractor, and we didn't use that to dig the hole. We had steel bars and dug holes in the ground with steel bars, and then the auger was used to dig the, dig the dirt out, just mm-hmm. to lift the dirt out. Mm-hmm. 
And then I got my first practice job, and I worked every weekend but two in my first practice job. And then after that, I did my radiology residency at the university at the vet school. Um, but at the same time, uh, three of us set up, uh, I was in Perth in Western Australia, mm. three of us set up Perth's um, first emergency clinic. And so one of us did a Friday, one of us did a Saturday night, and the other one did a Sunday night. And we would get called up by you know, the Australian Flying Doctor Service who would want to know about treating some dog that they'd come across. Mm. Uh, but uh, So I would work all week and, and doing radiology, my radiology residency, and then I would... Um, uh, and, and then you know I'd, I'd, we'd be set up as business, a small business running uh, running emergency veterinary care. So yeah, I was uh, so I just turned twenty two when I left the country after I finished my my DVM, and mm. uh, yeah, eventually. So I didn't do. I, I worked for five years in the in the private sector before getting a job, which allowed me to do my PhD while I was working at that job, and that was in in a in, in a biotech um, world. We were working on a, a natural animal model of um, leukemia, uh, blood cell cancer, mm. and uh, and it was virology, immunology, and cancer biology, and that's what mean that, that's that's why I got connected to the University of Bristol, and did my PhD through that. But that was uh, that was uh, five years out. In between, I did lots of things, worked on salmon farms, did some zoo work. What brought you to the U.S.? What brought you to Arizona specifically? Uh, a job, actually. So uh, my wife and I, we were both working for Tony Blair's office, the Prime Minister, mm-hmm. uh, dealing with the foot and mouth disease crisis of 2001. Mm-hmm. And uh, and uh, we, we just, our first child was on the way, and uh, she's a veterinarian too, and we were both working there. And uh, I, I didn't, we all have grandparents, but I didn't grow up with any grandparents, but she did, and it was a good thing. And so wanted to... Um, wanted to get a job in the US and with my PhD it was possible plus mm-hmm. I was married to an American citizen and so um, although I ended up coming coming to the US on my qualifications not because she was an American citizen that's how that's how my immigration worked at the time um, but anyway there was a job in, in this place called Mississippi State University mm-hmm. in Starkville Mississippi and uh, and it was seven hours drive from her parents in uh, in Knoxville Tennessee mm. and uh, and it was another three hours to an, to another set of parents, and so their parents were divorced when they were young, so two sets of grandparents, and so it's like I applied for the job, and uh, and uh, they, they ended up in Mississippi State for ten years. So that was why I went to academia. So I didn't know. Any, I, I again, first generation student. I didn't know the difference between assistant, associate professor, full professor. I'd never heard of tenure. Mm-hmm. I, I'd never heard of all the stuff. And going in, it was like the second time going into the strange environment where I didn't understand the language. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just treated it like like I could work in the private sector. Um, and so I arrived there in two thousand and two. Started as assistant professor, and then and then. Uh, um, just a little bit over nine years later, I, I ended up here in my current job. Wow. So that's why. So I, I didn't have a pathway expressly into academia. I just, uh, I just needed a job, mm-hmm. and uh, luckily I could get a job in the U.S. And so uh, Mississippi State was great. It was, uh, it was a phenomenal experience, phenomenal opportunities. A lot of people, you know, wouldn't 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 dream of moving to Mississippi. Well, that means there's a lot of opportunities, and mm-hmm. it's a, it's a great university. Can't say enough good things about it. It's a phenomenal place, and uh, Starkville, Mississippi, is a little island. We all have perceptions about Mississippi. Many of them are uh, well founded, mm-hmm. um, but uh, in the university town, Starkville, where where the, where the university is, it's it's a great little town, and uh, um, and then we had this opportunity out here, and and uh, uh, yeah, Arizona is a phenomenal state. Uh, you know, I was driving around with Joel actually. Uh, Joel is uh, Joel is my colleague. We drive around the state a lot together, and. Uh, we were driving around. We had to go to southeast Arizona to to, uh, to a small town there to, to visit one of our cooperative extension sites, mm. and then we looped up through Me- New Mexico and ended up in uh, uh, in uh, Navajo land mm. for a while, and then we were going to come back down. And I'd been sent this article by Paul Krugman, the New York Times economist, and the article was something like uh, "Rural Arizona is dead." I mean, rural sorry, rural America is is has no future something like that it, it's about three months old now the editorial and I read it and and it was all talking about rural America meaning Iowa Nebraska mm. all these places I can't remember that I'd never live in you know you fly over places right. yeah but uh, but I was driving around and uh, I know a lot of people in the Arizona wine industry and uh, um, and I was driving around thinking about Arizona and I'd been given an article on Arizona from uh, Arizona's highways and byways I think is the magazine mm-hmm. And it was a, a celebration of all 50 states. 
and you go through and there's a photo of all 50 states, there's a Louisiana bayou, there's Hawaii palm trees, there's all these pictures, 50 pictures of 50 states. And the kicker at the end of the article was, and these photos have all been taken in Arizona. And <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> it is cool. You should look it up. I've actually got a copy of it. Yes. But, uh, but then I realized, you know, Arizona, I'm not sure why rural Arizona should be lumped in with all these states which are just big and flat and have monocultures of agriculture. Mm-hmm. So one of the really cool things about this state on the agriculture side, which actually is a minority of what I do, is that uh, if you put a fence around Arizona, and said, uh, okay, that's it. You can only eat what's made here. That's all you can eat. Um, we'd, we'd have a Mediterranean diet, including wow. including fish, including wine, including olive oil. Uh, we grow a Mediterranean diet here. Can you explain the fish part? Yeah, we have aquaculture here. Mm. Yeah. But we would also have a lot of beef, right? Mm-hmm. So we would have beef. You could have, you could have beef that had been fed grain, which two-thirds of people prefer. You could have free-range beef, mm-hmm. which uh, one-third of people prefer. You could eat lamb. Uh, you could eat... Uh, you could almost, You couldn't eat... Well, you could eat chickens. You could eat chickens, mm-hmm. ducks, poultry, eggs, pork. You could eat, we, met, we have a pork producer in the state. Uh, you could eat uh, two or three different kinds of seafood that, that come out of aquaculture facilities down near Gila Bend. Wow. Down near Dateland. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's a pretty amazing state. So plus, then what are we? We're the Grand Canyon state, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. So do you guys know what Arizona's largest export is? Copper. How about you? I'm guessing you're going with tourism. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Oh. So, so you know, there's a there's a there's a direct uh, connection between between um, our wildlands and tourism. And um, and of course, agricultural food production, mm-hmm. especially in this state. When you look around it, eighty three percent or so of the state is not privately owned. Separate issue about how that's a big problem for our tax base for our schools. But so eighty three percent of the land, either federal or, or state, mm-hmm. with the people looking after it are the private ranchers. So you think all the land looks really pretty on the drive up to Sedona mm-hmm. or to uh, the Grand Canyon? Yeah, it's all private sector that's maintaining all that land. <clears throat> wow. Not in the national parks, obviously, but the national parks are tiny compared to the rest of the land. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you look at the tourism development around Sedona, uh, that was that, that, that was ranch land that was sold and they created a little town there. Uh, you look at the wine industry developing around Cottonwood, Camp Verde. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was just down in the wine land just on the weekend, just yesterday. Mm-hmm. Uh, drove down from Tucson into Sonoita. Oh, that's beautiful. It is beautiful, exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Do you know, I just found out this about six months ago. If you live in Bordeaux in France and you're really into wine, which I guess is compulsory if you live in Bordeaux. Sure. <laughs> uh, but also, yeah, that's the, really the main attraction. So, but I found out from someone who just went there that uh, – so if you go to Europe and you walk down the high street of some of these little villages, there's always a travel agent, right? And in the, in the front of the shop, there's always this little sign saying, go to Mallorca, go to Greece, go to wherever. Mm. You know, this much money for a flight and accommodation. Well, it turns out that if you're in Bordeaux and you're in the know, you're one of the people who really consider themselves on the cutting edge of wine, the place to go – of everywhere on the whole world is Arizona for wine. I feel like that's like a, a sort of like almost like widely known secret, you know? Yes. Like, <laughs> oh, you know that we have we, we have like I I know that there's like a wine sector, but I, like I it's not something that like I think is touted very often. Here. Not enough, and the wine is fantastic uh-huh. that it, I've had, especially from Sonoida. So I'm not so I'm not a super taster. So I I know that you know the best wine to me is the wine I can afford that I really like. Right, right. And whatever is open, whatever <laughs> bottles open, <laughs> and it doesn't give me a headache, right, the next day or during drinking it. But what's really fascinating at the wine industry here is it's not like California or Texas or many other places. It's more like Oregon, where they're focusing on on, on non commodity decommoditization. So the value of wine in the state. For the same bottle of wine, it's a. I, I bought a whole lot of bottles of wine at one point to give to people, and it took me a while to give them out. And each year I was giving them out that the bottles were worth about ten dollars more. Mm. It was a phenomenal investment. Mm-hmm. So it's uh, the other thing about wine is it's one of the most high value per drop of water crops there is, and it's also a very very water efficient crop. When you think about it, there's only one stem per yard and a half or so mm-hmm. taking water out of the ground. Plus the plus the uh, roots go really, really deep. Mm-hmm. And so they can get down into the water table once they're established. So um, so anyway, it's a great it's a great economic development for that area. Mm-hmm. Uh, people now fly down from New York State 
cyclists. They do these cycling tours around that area. Wow. Because when you go down there, once you get up on the plateau, mm-hmm. it's pretty flat. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, these are like professional, not professional, but you know, <laughs> hardcore amateur cyclists. Right. So I was talking to one of them and he said, well, we only do 60 miles a day. <laughs> uh, and I was saying... <laughs> Oh, yeah, no, that's relaxing for us. Wow. And I was like, really? Well, how much do you normally do? Oh, we normally do about 120 or something Ooh. when we go cycling. But, but anyway, there's this whole industry down there um, mm-hmm. that's developing. And, and so one of the things we're going to be doing at the, the college uh, through our School of Natural Resources and the Environment, and, and most of our peer land-grant universities don't have a School of Natural Resources and the Environment because they have a college, College of Forestry, College of Natural Resources, mm-hmm. College of something like that. But we are... Uh, one thing about higher education in, in, in this state is it's incredibly efficient in terms of administrative cost. And so mm-hmm. we have a lot. We have a very narrow, a very small administration on the academic side um, it, because really all the work is done by the faculty and the, and the other employees. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, one thing we're going to be focusing on is developing ecotourism degree. Great. So, it, But uh, you know, people say, what about agritourism? It's like, well, agritourism is really part of ecotourism. Right. Can you explain to our listeners who may not be familiar with what it means to be the land grant university? Yeah, that's great. That's a really good point. So it's named historically because they were started with grants of land from the federal government. And it was started uh, a guy called Justin Smith Morrill uh, in the Civil War, 1862, just after the Battle of Shiloh. Uh, he'd been trying to get this done for, oh, I don't know, 25, 30 years. He was a senator. Now, he was very rare in the Senate at that time. His dad, and I can never remember what his dad was. It was a bee trade. He was either a baker, a butcher, or a blacksmith. Mm-hmm. I can never remember which one of the three. But um, he made it to the Senate, and he was self-educated. And in those days, the only way you got into the Senate was if you had lessons in Greek and rhetoric and all the rest. Mm-hmm. And uh, and forever and ever, he had this dream that, that, that uh, at that time, the only way you got higher education was to be a member of the clergy or very wealthy. And the schools that existed were schools like Harvard. Mm-hmm. And uh, so they had the elite 1% and everybody else. So it was in the middle of the Civil War, and it was looking, it was looking pretty, um, pretty bad, actually. It was just before Gettysburg happened. And uh, um, Lincoln was kind of frustrated with what's going on. And, and Morrill got to him and said, you know, we've got to... Uh, they were really worried about the British and the French coming in on the southern side. Because the northern side, of course, had uh, the Federalists had had all the manufacturing, so they could make all their own shoes and things. And the, like all wars, it was going to be one on economics. Mm-hmm. And uh, but at that point, the Confederates were trying to uh, bring in the French and the British to invest. And of course, they were very, very interested because all the cotton was coming out of there, which was feeding the mills in in the Midlands of England, and all those mills, were, you know, all that cotton was going across to. Europe to be milled and you know, made into clothing, and so it was mm-hmm. big. It was a global economy even then. So what he said basically, uh, I'm sure he said it differently to how I say it, not just with a different accent. But he basically said, "We've got to, uh, we've got to take, take, uh, we've got to take advantage of our greatest natural asset." And so, you know, what's our greatest natural asset? Is uh, what is it? Yeah, we didn't have oil then, and we weren't thinking we had it. We weren't thinking about it. And he said, "No, it's, a, it's our people's brains. What if we educated everybody?" Mm. So Lincoln never wanted the country ever again to be threatened by a foreign power. They wanted, they wanted the country to be an economic superpower. So I did an analysis once. I looked at the rise of public education in the United States and compared it to GDP. And what happens is it's linear going up to 1862, and then it goes exponential mm. to the First World War. And then, of course, how did America win the First World War? They just came in with enormous amounts of money and technology. Mm-hmm. That's how they won the First World War managed to win the Second World War in a similar way. Mm-hmm. Didn't have the best technology, but they had the most of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the land-grant universities, what happened was every state got given a grant of land. Arizona didn't because Arizona was a confederate state. Mm-hmm. So in 1862, every state that was not not in rebellion was given a grant of land. And, um, and the, the point was to um, educate everybody in the agricultural, mechanical, and military arts. Hmm. And why those three? Well, most of the economy was agricultural. And then, of course, industrialization was just happening. Mm -hmm. So that's why the mechanical arts, we call that engineering today. Mm -hmm. And agriculture, we might talk about as food. Mm -hmm. So they were considered national security imperatives. So food today is still a national security Mm -hmm. imperative. Right now, we just saw Saudi Arabia get get drone attacked, 5% of the world's oil going up in smoke right now. Mm -hmm. Um, And we have a strategic oil reserve. Switzerland has a strategic food reserve. Mm. 
And that's one of the reasons Switzerland is such a big donor of food, because as the food just about gets its use by date, Switzerland gives it away and buys more for its strategic food reserve. Our strategic food reserve is happening to have a phenomenal agriculture system around the whole country. Mm-hmm. So anyway, coming back to it, and why the military arts? Because that was just how the world worked in those days. And so that's where the core still comes from, where we have um, you know, the kids who were walking around in uniforms on these land-growing universities. Mm-hmm. So that's where it came from. But then uh, there was two more federal acts. One act was we're educating all these people now, but how are we going to stimulate the economy? And it's all about innovation. So how are the discoveries going to get into the economy? Mm. Well, we've got these highly educated people. How are we going to even get the discoveries? So they came up with this concept of the experiment station. It's one of the things I I lead and manage now. Mm. And the experiment station was chunks of land where you would do research. Would one of those areas, just as I'm trying to visualize it, would that be kind of the farm that's on Campbell in Tucson? That That would be in those days they all looked like farms. But in those farms, there was the technologies of the day. So there was a time when a steam engine was as technologically advanced as as a quantum computer is mm-hmm. today, right? Mm-hmm. And no one trusted them. So where were this, Where was the trials going to happen? How are these? How are these? How are we going to find better ways of driving our economy? So we did what. That was the beginning of the United States Research Network, the universities being the United States Research Network. Mm. This is before the big, exceptional public universities, such as the University of Washington or ASU is another one now today. Mm -hmm. And so we had these research uh, facilities, and that, that was the Hatch Act of 1887. Well, that was all well and good, but then we had this problem, right? This stuff wasn't getting into the economy. So even though we these land grant universities were educating everybody, regardless of whether they were wealthy or a member of the clergy, mm-hmm. anybody could go. All right, so long as you could get the grades, you could go. We were still only educating a tiny, a few percent of the population because that's pretty much all anyone needed. But but this research was being done, and it wasn't getting out to the economy. And so what happened was faculty and students and stuff were starting to teach people things even if they hadn't matriculated into the university or take these technologies and and give them out to the local manufacturer or whatever to get them out into the marketplace. Mm. So then they formalized it in 1914 with what was called the Cooperative Extension System Mm. or that day Cooperative Extension Service, 1914, the Smith-Lever Act of 1914. So think of the Bayh-Dole Act Mm -hmm. but 100 years before, well maybe not, 80 years before Mm -hmm. and so 70 years before. So that's what it was, and so the, so the Cooperative Extension mission is to take the research discoveries from the university and get them into the economy. Also, to take the knowledge in the university and educate people of the state, regardless of whether or not they've matriculated into the university. Mm. And so this was, so the land grant universities were founded on an economic mission, the economic driving mission. They were founded on innovation. And that's where, um, that's where the United States today now has this network where when Sputnik comes flying over and they all, all worry a lot, mm-hmm. the massive push into um, research, and, and which becomes a massive economic development outcome, um, where they put the money uh, in the universities. Other countries set up federal or government research labs. Now, we have those two, mm-hmm. but, but the universities are disproportionate contributors to economic growth in the United States. And that's where it all comes from. It comes from this Land Grant Act because never again did Lincoln ever want the United States to be beholden to a foreign power Wow! economically. That is so fascinating. So so the program, well, I have a million other questions. Yeah, but go for it. The program that you oversee then, seeing as Arizona is one of the largest states land-wise in the entire nation, you're... I would assume that your program is also one of the largest nationally. I wish it was. We've had pretty devastating cuts to the budget. We were the, we're the most cut state in the union for f- state funding. Wow. So we're pretty big. Um, we do have a lot of land. Uh, we're also, the, I don't know if you know this, but um, Arizona is the most urban state in the union. We have a greater proportion of people concentrated in a couple of cities than any other state in the Union. That, by the way, makes us the most rural state in the Union. (laughs) So again, very similar to that model I described in New Zealand, where you have almost nobody in almost all of the state. Wow. Which is pretty cool, Mm -hmm. because then we have this incredible natural environment, Mm -hmm. which is also producing a Mediterranean diet, 
which would keep us really healthy. So look on the back of your food, right? Not yeah. made in Arizona. Don't eat it. Right. <laughs> and then you'll be really healthy. That's right. So um, I want to live here now that you're talking about. Yeah, like, <laughs> I love living here. I love living here. Yeah, this is where. So this is home for me. So this is why. It's one of the reasons it's home for me. So yeah, so we are certainly distributed. I have about uh, 150,000 acres of Arizona that we look after under the experiment station. We're cheating a little bit in the two, two of those, big chunks of those are, are two separate ranches. We have a ranch in northern Arizona. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it runs from um, from the elevation of Flagstaff right down to the elevation of Camp Verde. Oh and wow! So it covers uh, it covers uh, four different ecological bands from low desert to pine, um, and we have another ranch down uh, just between um, just on the side of uh, Mount um, Mount Wrightson, and. Uh, um, it's, uh, it's, it's on the other side of the mountains to where, where, the, uh, where the mine might be coming in. Mm. Near, near all the pecans, partway down towards uh, Nogales. And, uh, and that ranch, we've, uh, we have uh, completely 100% Wi-Fi coverage for a whole ranch. Wow. And that means at any given time, you can see what a cow is doing. So uh, we just genotyped all the animals actually way up north. That means that every single one of our breeding cows, 300 of them, um, they all have their genome done. Their genome sequenced. Wow. So my boss, the university president, talks a lot about the fourth industrial revolution. Mm-hmm. Convergence of biology, computing, and engineering. Um, and uh, if you think about food production, we've been converging those three forever. Mm-hmm. And so this is really good for us that everybody else is getting on the fourth industrial revolution bandwagon. Um, and then we're doing it too. So, um, you know, the dairy industry in Arizona, every single dairy cow has its genome sequenced and every single dairy bull, which don't live in Arizona, they all come in little straws of semen. Mm-hmm. Um, they, uh, they're, all, um, they're all genotyped and have been for the last, uh, what are we in, 2019? They have been for about the last five years. Wow. And actually, ironically, that's why the dairy industry is having problems. No one, no one realized the genetic gain this would make and how fast it would make, and that's why... In part, we have an awful lot of milk because these dairy cows mm-hmm. are now super cows. Mm-hmm. And in part, we have an awful lot of milk because, frankly, we never really thought about an export economy before. We export a little bit, but we're not like the exporting beer months of New Zealand or, mm-hmm. uh, or Ireland or France. I was wondering that, too. I was thinking about New Zealand comparing it to Ireland when you mentioned mm-hmm. kind of the agricultural yep. landscape there. That's what I was thinking. And I didn't realize Arizona was so huge. Who are the main exporters out of Arizona, is it like a shamrock or? The main export products out of Arizona are coming out of, uh, well, the dairy industry would be. Right? So we have a number of industries that are all about the same size, relative primary industry. So the primary, in, there's only three ways you can make brand new money, right? One is to print the stuff, mm-hmm. usually frowned upon, even for federal <laughs> governments, right? So we don't really want to be printing money or right. teaching people how to do that. So the other two ways in the primary economy, the foundation of the economy, is you can grow it from the sun or you can dig it out of the ground. Those are the only two ways to make brand new money. <laughs> Everything else is just cycling money around the economy. Right. That's so and, true. <laughs> and so the way we make brand new money in this state is the vegetable industry, massive vegetable industry coming out of Yuma. That's where Jake's from. I'm, I'm from Yuma. Oh, well, you yeah. know this. Yeah. Then, the right? salad bowl, or what is it called? I guess isn't Sel- salad, salad bowl. bowl. Salad I guess bowl. so. <laughs> salad bowl sounds good. So Yuma's a pretty remarkable place. So two massive industries down there: the military and mm. um, and and the vegetable production. So between November and March, if you eat something that looks green on a plate, mm-hmm. a leafy green, ninety nine percent chance it came from Yuma. If you live in Canada or the continental United States, well anywhere in the United States. Mm. But heck, you can go to. I went to a supermarket once in Dubai, and there was. Packaged goods from Yuma, Arizona. Wow. wow. <laughs> and so our two biggest ep- export countries, of course, are Mexico and Canada. Mm-hmm. Those are our two biggest markets. So that's the vegetable production industry. And there's also vegetable seeds. But that's about, oh, I'm going to lose track of the numbers here, but that's, that's one about $4 billion industry. Mm. Another about $4 billion industry is the dairy industry, concentrated in Pinal County primarily. Mm. Another about $4 billion industry is the beef industry. Mm-hmm. Um, Concentrated where? No, all around the state. If uh, I mean, there's a reason we need these cows out there, fire suppression, as well as feeding mm. people, keeping the watersheds healthy. 60% of Phoenix's water comes from the Salt River Project. Okay, the watersheds are all the mountains mm-hmm. up north of us. Mm-hmm. And uh, we don't have the elk, massive herds of, of, of buffalo or, I'm sorry, bison or, um, or elk or anything anymore. So these cattle play a huge environmental control 
fire suppression role. So that's the beef industry. And then we have um, the cotton industry, which is another massive mm-hmm. exporting industry. Most of that is going into Asia. Hmm. And then we have a few smaller ones that are associated. So Durham wheat, we have an incredibly high quality Durham wheat industry. Hmm. And the Durham wheat goes over to Italy, made into really expensive pasta, and then exported back. And we, re- when we buy it. <laughs> and we buy it. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> and then we have a few little industries you don't think of. So our aquaculture industry. Uh, we sell fish. Arizona sells fish. A couple of companies sell fish uh, into Las Vegas, L.A., live fish, again, decommoditized. And then you step down again, and we have... Um, like the wine industry, right? Okay, so it's a lifestyle lifestyle industry, but it's also a very much a commercial industry for other people, um, and uh, and then of course we have the beer month, right, which is the tourism industry. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, even golf courses. So one of the things we do is we we uh, have golf course management programs which help people understand how to use brackish water to um, irrigate golf courses so that we can drink the fresh stuff. Wow. But we're also we're also the world's number one water university. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, the number one water doing university, right? So we've got to create more water, and uh, we need more water. And water's a huge problem, of course, in Arizona. Mm-hmm. And so um, you know, a lot of other places are water talking, and we're water doing at the University of Arizona. So um, I was a little bit behind the news, and I was in China a few months back, and they all kept bringing, "You're the number one water." University in the world. It's like, great, a better look that up. Yeah. So, uh, add that to my talking points. <laughs> yeah, add to my talking points. And so, of course, everything's interconnected to water. And this is the state that really epitomizes the energy, water, food nexus. Mm. Um, just think about it, right? The, where does the energy come from? Hydro projects. Where does the energy go to? Pumping water for food production, et cetera, mm-hmm. and keeping people alive and healthy. Wow. Amazing. All right, Jake, I'll let you bring it back on to the, sorry, I took a lot of side turns <laughs> no, there. I no, knew no, that was going to no, happen because it's so interesting. Um, your program offers much more than agriculture, though. Um, what are some of these other areas that you guys are working on? Yeah, well, I really appreciate you saying that because only only 7% of our students are what we would call future agriculture students because agriculture is really having to focus on things like vertical farming, um, and other areas, but I, I'm actually going to have to read from a cheat sheet. Okay. So this is incredibly diverse. Yeah. Um, so we have future agriculture, um, which is 7% of our undergraduates. Uh, about 16% of our agriculture, I mean, of our students, our undergraduate students, are involved in commerce directly. That includes the retail science program. And so our students get hired straight into the likes of corporate Nike or corporate Walmart or corporate Lowe's or corporate PetSmart or corporate Saks Fifth Avenue or a whole bunch of stores that you may know about that I can't think of right now. Um, And so we also have the Global Retail Conference where we have Mm. CEOs from all around the country come and visit Arizona. We're on MSNBC Mm. and that's down in Tucson every spring. Um, Then we have 42% of our students are involved in health and wellness. And so that includes things like um, nutrition and nutritional sciences, Mm. dietetics, we teach all of the undergraduate uh, medical microbiology, wow. as well as food microbiology, as well as environmental microbiology. Um, 13% of our students are involved in uh, helping in education. We produce the states and other states agriculture education teachers who are also they're high school teachers. They're also qualified to teach high school biology, uh, and we're hoping to branch into teaching high school economics as well. Um, We uh, have family studies and human development students. Uh, Many of them go into social services, for example, social justice. Uh, 14% of our undergraduate students are sustainability. So think of anything to do with the environment. Mm -hmm. Um, We teach eight and a half, sorry, we, uh, yes, we teach eight and a half times the the environmental sustainability natural resource students that the rest of the university does put together. Uh, We do three and a half times the research in that area that the rest of the university does put together. Uh, and then uh, science and technology. So we have biosystems engineering, for example. That's 8% of our undergraduates. Uh, we share that program, the biosystems engineering program, with the College of Engineering. Um, and we're really proud of that program because it has the, the same proportion of females that the state does. About 50% of those That's engineers cool. come in. They come out as engineers. Eight, they're accredited engineers when they come out of that program. Um, and they uh, about 52% of those students are female. So the next best program is the biomedical engineering program uh, in in the school in the College of Engineering, and that's about um, that's about twenty five percent female. 
and then all the other engineering programs are about 12.5%. So we're all aware of the problems that engineers are having with, 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 with uh, gender diversity. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so what do these people do? These biosystems engineers, for example, they might go work for Medtronic, uh, worrying about smart pacemakers. Mm. Or there was in the news just recently um, a, a rapid norovirus diagnostic uh, using an iPhone mm. that was coming out of our biosystems engineering program. Amazing. Or they might be involved in water engineering, uh, engineering ecosystems with microbiomes, uh, which microbiomes is all the soil soil uh, bacteria. So think of remediation and mining. We talked mm-hmm. about mining before as being one of part of the primary economy, very important to Arizona. One of the copper is one of the seas. Mm-hmm. So you've got extraction and the rest of it. So engineers do the extraction, dig it out, grind it up, use chemicals to extract whatever. And then you've got the rest of it. Well, we do all for the rest of it. Wow. Remediation. So that's what we do in the undergraduate program. And then we have a research program which doesn't quite match proportionately the undergraduate education program. So we have, we are, uh, we're a very serious component of, of the university's research program. Mm-hmm. We get funding from every agency you can imagine, from NASA, Department of Defense, um, NIH. We actually, get a, we actually don't even get a plurality of our funding from the USDA. We, oh. we, we, most of our funding comes from other agencies. NIH is a really big one. That surprises that. me. Yeah, it surprises everybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. I was watching a promo, actually, for the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences at uh, University of Arizona. And um, in it, you said something sort of to the tune of um, everything you learn here is being taught by people who are trying to change the world. Right. Um, so uh, you know, I kind of love this idea of a sort of socially conscious or environmentally sustainable, almost altruistic business. Um, as contradictory as those two words may seem, um, what are some of these life these 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 world changing ideas, and how do they sort of connect to the world of enterprise at the College of uh, Agriculture and Life Sciences? Everything's founded on a everything's founded on a fundamental principle. Like you know, we we talked at the beginning how everybody is basically a, a, a sum of their their history, their their, their experiences. Um, one of our one of our goals, our, our goal, our strategic intent, is the way we say it actually, for our education program is to produce employable graduates mm-hmm. who can create jobs for others and do jobs that don't yet exist. So every decision I make around our teaching program has to fit in that strategic intent. So firstly, we know because we survey about ninety six percent of our incoming freshmen are there because they want to get a job or they want to go to graduate or professional school. Mm-hmm. Might be medicine, might be veterinary medicine, might be pharmacy. And so <clears throat> first thing is I often say that Niels Bohr would have worked for the College of Science. Really important basic science and really looking at science mm-hmm. for that. He said to Niels, hey, you know these neutrons you're studying, you know, one day they'll power cities. One day they'll be used in a world war. And he would go, yeah, isn't that nice? Now look at the pretty neutron, okay? Now, Louis Pasteur would have worked for us. And so what does Louis Pasteur do? Well, he worries about, he ends up creating the world's first live attenuated vaccine. Mm. Okay, he ends up understanding how we can put milk in bottles and not poison everybody mm. with pasteurization. Oh, he does 101 different things, all very much applied. So coming back to your point, um, every one of our students is very much just connected to the reality of the world. When we look at the private sector, it divides into two. Uh, the for-profit private sector and the not-for-profit private sector. That's the way of the world. So, But they've got a few things in common. Um, one is they can't afford to go bankrupt. Okay, And the universities are the same. It's a good incentive. <laughs> it's a really good incentive, but that's how the world works, right? So yeah. the whole world turns around behavioral economics. Mm-hmm. And it's much easier to pull on a string than push on a string. So when we think about sustainability, it's definitely those three pillars of sustainability. So when we talk about Cooperative Extension's mission, I talk about... We deliver dollars, jobs, or genuine social impact into the private sector. Dollars, whose dollars? Well, it depends. If you're an employer, if you're losing dollars, that's not a good thing. For the stakeholders, or if it's a if it's a food bank, for example, that's not a good thing. So Cooperative Extension does that. Jobs, well, you know, I came here during the Great Recession, and we worry about people's jobs. Mm-hmm. And who provides jobs? The private sector, for profit and not for profit. And then the third one is genuine social impact. Well, let's, we, one of our programs is the First Miles program, where 
where we have kids between zero and five and, and we have dental hygienists that work for us out and about in the counties. And these dental hygienists are the first dental hygienists these kids have ever seen. Mm. And they've got really bad and really painful mouths. They're not gonna be learning to read if they can't concentrate because their mouths are so sore. So that's what I mean by genuine social impact. Mm -hmm. So let's come cycle back to what you were saying, this word sustainability. So sustainability only works if there's an economic model that makes it work. Ecotourism could be that economic model. Mm -hmm. You heard of the Galapagos? Mm -hmm. Okay, the Galapagos Islands. Southern Arizona is the Galapagos Islands without the ocean. We have these things called sky islands. Yeah. Okay, evolution is happening on the sky islands exactly the same way as it's happening on the Galapagos. Mount Am Mount Lemon, right? Mount Lemon is one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mount Wrightson's another. Mount Graham is another. Where the Mount Graham Red Squirrel is actually one of our programs. You may have heard of that. Mm -hmm. The zoo zoo up here. We're partnered with the zoo up here mm -hmm. because it got it got absolutely obliterated by a really nasty fire mm. on Mount Graham, which, by the way, is where the Vatican Telescope is. College of Science looks up to the big telescopes on Mount Graham. We look after the Mount Graham Red Squirrels and all, so of the cool. and all of the natural resources. And that's a whole ecosystem, whether it's an economic ecosystem or a natural ecosystem, mm -hmm. all put together. And so, you know, absolutely am I not, am I, am I saying, you know, don't go to the College of Science. It depends who you are. If you really are a basic science person, you know, go to the College of Engineering if, you, if you're into building computers, right? But mm -hmm. we all, we're components of this one ecosystem. And so there's an economic ecosystem, there's our natural ecosystem, and there's our social ecosystem. And of course, those are the three pillars of, of, the, of, of sustainability. And so when we think about that, and people, um, you know, people really care about what they want to do. Um, I think that this, you know, we've just had Generation Z, depending on who you talk to, Generation Z is either uh, just come in this year or been with us the last two years as mm -hmm. undergraduate students. Um, and, uh, you know, everybody is fundamentally looking for an opportunity to make a difference. Uh, we all mm -hmm. are. And uh, so we are very, we are wanting to be very clear on articulating how we make the make an opportunity to make a difference. Um, our research strategic intent is to be an economic driver for the state, not the economic driver. And why in the research? Why isn't that in the, in the undergraduate one? Because it's kind of cheating. Every university gets to say it's an economic driver. Why? Because we're the only ones allowed to give degrees out. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's kind of mm -hmm. cheating. We're doing that anyway. Right. But if we focus on our research, it makes us think, how are we getting our research into the economy? And uh, all of our research connects the economy in the same way. No matter what we're doing, whether it's in retail science or ecosystem science or in aquaculture or in, um, uh, we've got a C. diff project, Clostridium difference. Mm. Um, and it's a, it's a project where you know, people get nosocomial infections from hospitals mm. and they get very, very sick when they go in and get antibiotics. And so we now have a non-antibiotic therapy for C. diff in hospitals in partnership with Veterans Affairs. Wow. And uh, yeah, that's going to become a spin-out company. I can't remember if it's being licensed or being a spin-out company. Mm. Now that's in our School of Animal and Comparative Biomedical Sciences. So the good thing about the world today is all these disciplines are coming together. Mm -hmm. So if we're worrying about uh, maternal fetal health in our ruminants, well, guess what? That's the same maternal fetal health we have in our humans. So all of the states, all of our pediatrician residents do their research projects with our sheep mm. in maternal fetal health. Wow. Because sheep is the best model for human maternal fetal health. Wow. So this is the kind of stuff. I, I, I don't know if that connects into your question, but yeah, everything, no, everything yeah. integrates into the private sector, whether it be for-profit or not-for-profit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people move in and out of the for-profit, not-for-profit not private sectors all the time. I yeah. think you did yourself, Kimberly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. So that's one of the questions. I think you, you've pretty well answered it, but... If I am a student interested in studying sustainability at the U of A, what kind of career path might I have? And it could be basically anything, especially within within your college. So what's really, really important, right, is the universities have got to treat, teach people, that give, the, give people a technical basis. Mm -hmm. When I went through vet school, I had a stack of books literally about two meters high that I had to memorize. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, we're walking around with supercomputers now. We don't need to memorize the facts. We need to know how to how to access them and how to access them quickly. Right. And then we learn our heuristics as, as we go through life and our mm -hmm. jobs. But the other component is we've got to have the the kind of skills that employers want today. Some people call them, the business school calls them soft skills. Mm -hmm. I don't like that term because these are all skill, skills that our brains are managing with our neurotransmitters. So going into, uh, going into flow is the same neurotransmitters as the biology of trust. 
Mm. And all of retail is built around trust. Mm-hmm. Okay, and all of business is built around trust. Mm-hmm. Right. So we care about greatly about the biology of trust. All of behavioral economics is founded in trust between economic transactions. So what we're partnering with is we're partnering with um, the um, also strongly with the the College of Law and also strongly with the College of Humanities Mm -hmm. because all of our students are STEM students, science, technology, engineering, and math. Mm -hmm. Problem is for us, technical problem, technical solution, everyone's just going to love it. How's that working for GMOs, Mm -hmm. right? Okay, because the world works on policy, politics, culture, religion, Mm -hmm. okay? So we've got to connect the humanity with the science and technology. So so one of the things the university's got to do, we've got to give people a technical base mm-hmm. in what we talk about. My boss would call it the fourth industrial revolution. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't matter where you are. I mean, there, there isn't a single job that I know of where, where someone doesn't have a laptop. Right. Right. And even today, what are we doing? It's all on computers, right? Yep. And uh, at the same time, we've got to give them a cultural understanding and, and a way to work in the world. So Jake has started a task force here at the Better Business Bureau for sustainability so that we can do some really basic um, kind of cost saving and environmental saving practices here around reducing our plastic, reducing our paper. So if I'm a business owner listening to this and I care about the environment, but I don't have the technical skill set because maybe I got my business degree or maybe I didn't go to college at all or maybe I went to a trade school, but I I care about the environment, I want to make an impact, what can I do in my small business today? Okay, well, so the first thing that happens for everybody, just a general principle, not for the small business owner, is is there's some real experts in the world who are good at this stuff. Mm-hmm. So we're partnered with the Anthropocene Institute in California to save the world's fish. Mm. Okay, so the first thing is some real, real, real super experts in doing things. So one thing you can do as a business owner is you, all business owners, they're the people that the whole economy is working around. Mm-hmm. So you can look around and find out somebody who's really making a difference and you can invest in them. Mm-hmm. And that's a high leverage way of doing it. How would you invest in them? You might invest your time, you might invest your money. So that's thing one. It's not a direct answer to your question. And that's exactly, by the way, what Warren Buffett did. Mm-hmm. You know, he said to Bill Gates, hey, you seem to be really good at this whole foundation thing and, and investing in things that are making a difference. Mm-hmm. I haven't a clue, but it's really important to me. How can I put my resources in? How can I put my money in to do that? So I'd say don't hesitate to think that way. Mm-hmm. Okay, We don't all have to save the world ourselves. Right. And when you're talking about sustainability, you're talking about environmental sustainability. Mm-hmm. Right? We were involved, I was involved in, um, started actually a little push. There's a, there's a thing around the world which was to use less petroplastics plastics from petroleum because because of the whole microplastic issue and the fact that they take some 2,000 years to break down. So there are bioplastics. They work just as well. Trouble with bioplastics is we don't have the infrastructure that would make them less expensive. So I have moved from, from using petroplastics in sort of cutlery at work to using bioplastics. Mm. Tenfold increase in cost. Mm. And so we're doing it not because we can afford to do it, but because one of the ways we can afford to do it is to start washing metalware, Mm -hmm. (laughs) okay? And then if we are having to use it, so one of the things is to use a heck of a lot less plastic cutlery, Mm -hmm. hopefully tenfold less so I can break even, and then then use another system to to do it. And it's all balanced, right? So now I'm using more water. Mm -hmm. But it's really really a whole network of energy. So I'm actually using less water because it takes a lot of water to make anything. Right. So... um, so, yeah, I think there's a lot of things to look at. But, I mean, you really got to do, it comes back down to, to the economics of it. Now, if you are going to be facing greater costs, there's a lot of consumers who care. So how are you marketing what you're doing? Mm-hmm. And now everybody's willing to pay something to get what they want. But there's always a limit to that, right? Mm-hmm. Are you willing to pay 10 times as much to use bioplastic plastics? Mm-hmm. But at least use the maybe then use the recyclable ones mm-hmm. and start recycling. But I think it's a pragmatic way to do it. But if you want to have a really large impact, you know, there are genuinely some organizations that are having really large impacts. And we work with those organizations too. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. It does. No, it's yeah. helpful. Yeah. I want more. What I would like to see more of up in Phoenix is more Antigone's bookstores that you guys have in Tucson that are solar powered completely run off of the energy that we have the most of, right, in Arizona. So I think that's a really good point. And so, again, it comes down to policy, politics, law. We have a lot of electrical utilities that have sunk a lot of costs in 
in infrastructure. So mm. how are we going to work with the people who've sunk costs in infrastructure in a capitalist system to enable them to transition to, for example, solar power? Mm-hmm. Right, but we have another a lot of other technologies too. You know, we should be looking at what is the safest way to generate energy that allows us to do everything we want to do. Mm-hmm. So we actually have quite a lot of water in Arizona. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. it's a little bit saline. So how do we walk to using our economic system? How do we walk to these sustainability principles? Put one foot in front of the other. There's a lot of people who really know how to do this. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, other countries which are which which have much more government control just decide we're all going to become solar Mm -hmm. and so people pay large taxes to subsidize these transitions Mm -hmm. in some ways we're paying taxes that are not money taxes to not make these transitions Mm. okay it costs us costs us in our environmental health costs us in our personal health Mm -hmm. it's still a form of taxation if you're paying health bills instead of paying a government tax i'm certainly not saying increase taxes all i'm saying is there's a whole lot of really when we talk about educating our students we want them to have um, be able to have educated conversations and think about life cycle analyses mm-hmm. rather than thinking, well, this must be the best way to go because it's compostable. Well, but maybe that product costs 10 times as much to mm-hmm. produce in energy. So there's, it's a very complex network. And But this is what I would say is uh, I think the thing that sets humans apart is not our opposable thumbs, not our brain. The fact that none of our brains are quite the same and yet we're really, really good at networking our brains together to come up with innovations. Mm-hmm. I just want to throw something in there that, that may be relevant. So uh, people, we always bandy this word innovation around all the time, right? Mm-hmm. And ask people to define it, and maybe they can, maybe they can't. So so one of the things I have is I've, I have a very clear definition of it that, that's very relevant to us in the university. So I say innovation has four components. I say it has inspiration, mm-hmm. invention, implementation, and investment. I like that. So we're really pretty good at the universities at invention. But the inspiration for what we want to invent is coming from the outside world. So we have a a collaboratory that we we started in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences that now the College of Medicine has joined us, the College of Pharmacy has joined us, Mm -hmm. to fight antimicrobial resistance, which is an existential threat to human human existence, antibiotic-resistant superbugs. Mm -hmm. Okay. The inspiration is coming from the 99% of the people who don't work in the universities. No one, the reason the E. coli outbreak mm-hmm. that, that happened from you was so bad is one, it was a highly toxic kind of E. coli. Two, it was antibiotic resistant. Mm. You could get a really bad bug, but if the antibiotics are going to treat it, what's the problem? Right. You get both put together, that's lethal. Mm-hmm. Okay. Do that on a grand scale and you've got an existential threat. So coming to back, the inspiration is coming from the outside. We have to be very aware. Our students bring this inspiration in. Mm-hmm. Okay, the inspiration you provided. You know, I really would like these bookstores that go 100% energy efficient. Mm-hmm. Well, then we've got to invent something that makes sense from an economic point of view. Okay, then we've got to get it implemented. Again, Land Grant University. How do we get that back into the economy as fast as possible? Mm-hmm. So we see a lot of microenergy projects in the work that we're doing with the Native American people Mm -hmm. because they don't have the infrastructure. And we're actually partnering with um, Tesla, with the Navajo people, on micro energy and battery storage for clean water. So the inspiration was, how do we give people clean water when there's no infrastructure to do Mm -hmm. it? And then, of course, you've got rounds of investment. So we've got to invest in the baseline so we can have these inventive people. Every successful society in the history of civilization go right back to the Greeks, go right back to the Egyptians. Every successful civilization said, we're going to invest in what Richard Florida calls the creative class. We're going to invest in people who don't have to make food or don't have to make vehicles or don't have to make something we all use. We're going to invest in them and we're going to let them dream and think Mm. but we're also going to make sure we're capturing that value that we're investing in Mm -hmm. so we have the privilege in the universities of doing research now it's pretty hard work you've got to write grants the success rate is five percent it can wear people out my faculty are working 70 or 80 hours a week this is not a this is not a trivial and they're the smartest people we've got Mm -hmm. in our society uh in the in the in, in the university system and of course, we get tons of smart people. Silicon Valley is loaded with them, right? But where they all come from? 
even if they didn't even yeah. if they didn't get their degree they all went to university i wanted mm-hmm. to study on this too all these successful entrepreneurs they all went to university at some point even mm-hmm. if they never bothered getting their degree all the way through so um, so we've got to we've got to invest in our universities but we've got to invest in our seed companies we've got to find bio biotech parks for example a very great incubators how do we invest in incubation mm-hmm. and then how do we find systems we've developed systems like angel investors venture mm-hmm. capital that allow things to go through in this continual uh, investment. So we've got to make sure that we're getting implementation into the marketplace. Or so the innovation is just a daydream. It's not really a, it's not really an innovation. Mm-hmm. It's just a cute little fun toy that we created, right? Yeah. And so that's one of the things we really focus on. I will tell you that that attitude is really common in the universities, whether it's our university, the University of Arizona, or ASU or NAU. And by the way, this state is blessed with three phenomenal universities. Mm-hmm. In uh, in thirty states, NSU, NAU rather, in thirty states, NAU would be the flagship university. Thirty oh, states. Wow. wow. And ASU is about twice as big as them in terms of research power, and U of A is about twice as big as big as ASU. So pretty remarkable. Okay, so we're going to do something we really like to do called five fast facts. Five fast facts. Say that five times fast. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> We do this, and then, Jake, you can ask your signature question afterwards, which we stumped Joel with when we were getting your information. Okay, so your favorite food or dish, but we wanted to know what your favorite kiwi food was. My favorite kiwi food? Yes. I would say it would be something called power fritters. And power is the Maori name for abalone. Mm. Although I quite like uh, I quite like New Zealand crayfish as well, and uh, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc's pretty good too. You can have three. <laughs> and New Zealand lamb is really good. That's very good. I've had that. Is <laughs> it? Well, what's a pa- oh? So it's like abalone. You said it's like abalone. You grind it up, and it's uh, it's 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 at the you get it at the fish shops instead of instead of having fish and chips, you could have power fruit and chips. When I was a kid, Sounds we used good. to go and just get abalone, six or eight inches wide. Six or eight inches long, mm. and uh, <coughs> you you take them out of the shell and you pound the heck out of them with a wooden mallet, and then you put them on the what we call a barbecue the grill, mm-hmm. and uh, you just have this big abalone steak. Just did, that's what I did when I was a teenager. I'd go down and spearfish and snorkel and pull these things up, and that's what I had for lunch. Wow, <laughs> cool. Okay, so if you could be an animal, which animal would you be, and why? If I could be an animal. Uh, I think I'd be a human because we run the place. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. That's probably the most logical answer I've ever that heard would of that be. question. I'd quite like to be. I actually would quite <laughs> like to be a whale. That sounds cool. I'd like to be in on and under the water and being a whale would be kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Now that we've stopped hunting them generally, uh, it's mm-hmm. kind of a good job. Mm-hmm. I like it. What's your What's your favorite place to vacation? My favorite place to vacation? Yes, because you've been all over the world. so Wherever I've chosen to be at the time. Nice. Are you sure you're not a philosopher? <laughs> well, I've got a I've, I've got a degree in philosophy. That's, That's right. what a PhD That's is. Right. It's a doctor in philosophy. <laughs> That's right. Okay, what are you reading right now? Is there what a book I'm, that you'd recommend? Oh, I recommend. I have like four or five books that I really recommend. But uh, you want to know what I recommend or what I'm reading right now? Let's do both. Okay. Well. There's a really, really interesting book, which I don't think is well-named, but it's called Turn the Ship Around, which is about how to make teams work and to uh, allow people the the freedom and the autonomy to do things on a nuclear submarine, mm. which is pretty remarkable mm-hmm. way of looking at the world. Um, and the book I'm reading right now, which I'm kind of halfway through and I have to pick up again, is about how to make highly individual and or how to allow highly individual and highly skilled in people to uh, to work in teams and it's uh, I wish I could remember what it was called but it's about uh, about the Mars company the chocolate company mm-hmm. uh, we work with the chocolate we work with them a little bit on on saving cacao in the world so that was kind of how I tripped over it so that's what I'm reading right now cool. I read a lot of books and so I, I wish uh, I wish you told me I needed a list of books so I could have some titles. We didn't spring that. This is this was a surprise sneak attack yeah. question, and, and, sh- and not a single one of them is a book on philosophy that I can think of right now. Okay, so what mm. is the scariest animal you've ever encountered? Because as Americans, we think 
Scariest. I mean, my dad would have me watch all the animal shows growing up, right? PBS, Animal Planet, and he would always tell me, don't be scared of the Arizona desert because the scariest animals live in New Zealand and Australia. Okay, New Zealand doesn't have any scary animals, just to let you know. <laughs> okay. It's like it's like the most safe place to go and lie around in the, in the bush and nothing will get you. Good. Um, there's one spider that hurts a little bit. So long as you're not really, really young like a little baby or really, really old, then you're perfectly safe. Nothing in New Zealand will hurt you. Okay. okay. Australia, on the other hand, when I... Uh, <laughs> When I got over here, uh, Australia, when I, I moved to, to America about 18 years ago, Australia had nine of the 10 deadliest snakes. Mm-hmm. And then they found another one. Now they've got 10 of the 10 deadliest snakes. <laughs> That's the worst statistic <laughs> so, for me. That is the scariest yeah, spot. Yeah. We, we do have, we do have. So, so the two, I'll tell you the two scariest animal stories. I was in, uh, I was in Okavanga Delta, which is in Botswana, and I was on foot. Uh, and uh, came across a, a, a big uh, female elephant, and we were between her and uh, the rest of her animals. And being next to an elephant in the zoo is like quite different to being next to an elephant in the wild. And for some reason in the wild, they're like 10 times bigger. Mm-hmm. And so that was kind of scary. The mm-hmm. second scary moment was I was in practice in Perth in Western Australia, and a lady came in with her cat, and she said, uh, my cat's been bitten by a snake. And I said, um, people either came and said, my cat's been bitten by a snake, or it's got, or it's been shot. Usually it had a cat bite abscess. Okay, but I said, how do you know the cat's been bitten by a snake? So she reaches into her handbag, and she pulls out the snake in the <gasps> jar. <laughs> she cut it. Oh, my God. And as she puts it on the table, it's like, oh, my God, I don't want to drop this jar. So it was a, it was a tiger snake, which is in the top nine of ten. And so it's like, yeah, yeah. And so how'd you get that? I just reached down. My cat was playing with them. <laughs> so I don't know. Those are the two scary animal stories. I've done a lot of stuff with lots of different wild animals. and I worked in the zoo. One, oh, I tell you one other scary So We had this, uh, it was a tiger. I worked with Perth Zoo at one point mm-hmm. it was when I was doing my radiology residency. And the zoo was going to put this tiger to sleep, going to euthanize this tiger. And the reason was it was a, a crossbred tiger between a Sumatran tiger and a, and a Bengal tiger. Anyway, it's a crossbred. So it's not worth anything to breed. And so in this, and the reason they were going to put the tiger down is he had chronic ear infections. Mm-hmm. Now, human beings' ears go in and out in a straight line. Animals' ears drop down vertically, and then they go horizontally. And so they can get these very chronic infections that can be antimicrobial resistant. You have to do surgery on them. But the tiger wasn't worth anything, so it wasn't worth the cost of the surgery. Mm. So it was the day after Christmas Day, and uh, I was doing radiology, so I had access to a mobile radiology unit we put on the back of a truck. So we, uh, a friend of mine was working in the zoo. Another friend of mine was a, was a small animal uh, clinician at the, at the university. And so day after Christmas, we drove out, and uh, we put this, knocked this tiger down, gave it an anesthetic with a dart gun, and we pulled it in. And then my job was to do the anesthetic. This friend of mine was going to do the surgery, and the zoo vet was going to be helping out on the surgery. And we were going to, we were going to do what was called um, oral resection, lateral ear resection. So you take out the vertical part of the ear and make it look more like a human ear. So it's, it's open to the air. You can get antibiotics in there. It doesn't become this nasty, festering environment of bacteria. So anyway, doing the surgery, the cat is, this, is a, this cat weighs about uh, 800 pounds, this tiger. It's on this bench, a little bit like the table we're sitting at here, stretched out. The zoo vet, she was crouched behind the tiger's head against the wall because the table was built into these two walls. So she was crouched behind the tiger's head. I was at the tiger's tail where we'd put a drip line in the tiger, and I was doing the anesthetic. So we had a, 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 an endotracheal tube the size that we use for horses, and we put it into the tiger's trachea. It's my job to do that. We put it into the tiger's trachea. We'd give this thing a dart. It was asleep. It would be asleep for about 10 minutes. Put the ET tube into its trachea. And uh, and then, then we connected it to a gaseous anesthetic machine. Same one you'd get in hospital, right? It's much bigger. The size. Mm. It's a horse one. It mm. has a big bag. Tiger's breathing in and out. And uh, when cats are light with anesthesia, they start twitching their ears and they start twitching their whiskers. So this friend of mine, Danny Atkins was his name, he said, Shane, this cat's waking up. Oh, no. Now, we're behind, oh, no. we're behind <laughs> two padlocked doors with a keeper with a gun behind us. So we to get out, we had to do two padlocks to get out. Shane, this cat is waking up. Oh, no. So, so I go around the front, and the cat, the seal and the ET tube had come loose mm. in the cat's trachea. So what I had to do, so this cat is waking up. His jaws are starting to go. Mm-mm. 
a little bit, moving a little bit. I'm going to have so, a nightmare about this tonight. So what I had to do was I had to reach into the cat's mouth, shoulder depth, and these cat's heads are really big, so I had to reach in shoulder, and replace the, the endotracheal tube inside the cat. I was right up. The cat's nose was where my nose is. Oh, man. The cat's tongue was looked like sandpaper. <laughs> no way. And I had a piece of um, two-by-four wood holding the cat's jaw shut. Open rather, and so yeah. So if it had, if I had dropped the wood and it had flinched, it would have taken my arm off. So anyway, it went back to sleep after that. So wow. that's kind of I have a lot. You of risked stories. your whole arm. I had a lot of stories. Woo! Like that also. <laughs> that so, wasn't yeah, making me that, nervous. That was way way back in 90, 1990, I think. Wow, amazing. Okay, so we have a bonus to our five fast facts. They weren't really fast facts, were they? I know, but it's a fun game. So <laughs> this one, we apologize because it's somewhat stereotypical, but Jake and I are nerds, and we would like to know, have you or anyone you know been to the places where Lord of the Rings was filmed? Yeah. Or were extras in the movie? No, We'd be I, even more uh, excited I don't, to know. I, don't, I probably know some extras, but I don't know that I know some extras. So, yeah, Lord of the Rings pretty amazing. Um, and so, yeah, I've been to lots of the places you see on the movies because mm-hmm. that's where I grew up. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, um, but I did go to where the movie set is. So when I was at vet school, I had to milk dairy cows for three months as part of my training. And so where they, where the location is, where they, where Hobbit, Hobbiton is called, mm-hmm. where the location is, um, that is actually just a few miles away from where I grew up, where I was doing dairy farming. Now, of course, it wasn't there when I was dairy farming. Mm. But I actually went back to New Zealand and took my son along. I had work there, uh, not last February, but the February before. And uh, and uh, because of the work I was doing, there was a there was a, a trip to Hobbiton, and I thought, yeah, movie set, yeah, fine. <laughs> and uh, it was unbelievable. And they built it all because they knew they were going to make all these movies. They built it all to the same quality you built houses. Wow. And so what it is is you go in there. They hunted around the whole country, and they looked at what Tolkien had described the, the size of the, the the particular tree in mm-hmm. the book. And they found a tree of that shape and the a valley of that shape and everything. And so you stand there, and in the description that Tolkien wrote is you're standing in this place that just by, I mean, by chance is going to be somewhere on the planet that looks wow. just like that. And right. they found it in the Waikato region. It's called Waikato. That's the region. It's the province of New Zealand. They found it. It's about, this This thing's about an hour and a half, two hours south of Auckland. And, uh, yeah, we went there, and uh, it's it's incredible what they built. I was just absolutely astounded. So, yes. That's amazing. I love it. That's exciting, too. Well, you too could do it. Just buy a plane ticket. That's right. Just <laughs> you a ask short, every, short Do you flight. ask everybody that question? No, just you. Did you ask Paolo that question? <laughs> we didn't. I'm sure we asked him something else that was specific to his region. Yeah. Have you done nothing but live on beef cows uh, <laughs> your entire time growing right. up? Right. Talk about your... Yeah, exactly. Okay, Jake has our question that everybody gets. Everyone gets this question. Um, if you could meet one person living or dead, who would it be and why? Yeah, Alfred Russell Wallace. You heard of him? I did a little bit of research. I cheated. Uh, but he's credited with co-discovering um, or or describing evolution, right? Yeah, yeah. proof of the theory of evolution. Mm. So unlike Darwin, who I think is pretty impressive, um, Alfred Russell Wallace wasn't born with a silver spoon in his mouth. Mm. So this was the era of, of Pasteur, of Darwin, of Banks, where there was all these people who were the few who were educated, the aristocracy or the mm-hmm. clergy, um, and Darwin was was uh, manufacturing money. That's where his money was from. Uh, who could afford to go off and find themselves by getting on a boat and sailing around the world and tromping around the Galapagos and doing all these things? Well, Alfred Russell Wallace had to work for a living. He was uh, he was middle class, no education per se, and so he ends up in. Uh, in the jungles of Indonesia, he ends up actually living in what is now Singapore, which was Malaysia at the time. And as part of his job, he, he worked out independently the theory of evolution. And actually, if he hadn't like pushed Darwin along, Darwin might not have got around to actually writing it up. Wow. So uh, uh, actually, he, um, yeah, he did a lot of this work, but he was doing it all while he was working in the private sector. So wow. I thought that's kind of cool. Yeah. I think that uh, – so anyway, I'd love to talk to him about uh, how challenging that was and uh, how he came up with these theories. I mean, that was a, uh, you did pre-warn me about this one, which is great. I don't know if that's telling secrets, but, um, <laughs> but I, you know, I could, I could dream up lots of people. But I think, I think he's a name that history's forgotten that I really wish they hadn't. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, I'm a, on my business card, it says FRS, which stands for um, – sorry, it says um, 
FLS, which stands for the Fellow of the Linnaean Society, mm. which uh, which is in the UK. It's their biology, it's professional biology society, and uh, you sign a book to become a member, and uh, you're in a room, which is the room that that uh, Wallace and Darwin both together first made public the theory of evolution wow. in London. Oh, cool! And you signed the same book they signed. Wow. So that's pretty cool. That's very cool. And that has Linnaeus' original plant connections. Don't know who Linnaeus is. Look him up. He was amazing too. But uh, yeah. Thank you so much for being here. This oh, was a blast. And I know that we'd love to have you back anytime. Wonderful. I think I'm busy next week, but maybe the week after. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. No, no, I'd love to. Thank you so much. I really appreciate everything. And really what I did want to finish off saying, and I don't know where you might want to edit this, but mm-hmm. uh, Nothing that, that, that we can do in, in the higher education sector is possible without the economy that is driven by your members. And mm-hmm. so uh, huge respect for the private sector, and that's why we do everything we do. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank, thank you. you. We would like to thank Dean Burgess for joining us this episode. In case you didn't catch it, Shane and his colleague Joel, who was sitting in the room with us while we recorded, drive thousands of miles all around the state visiting the university's various cooperative extension sites. And they were kind enough to stop by the BBB office to have that wonderful conversation you just listened to. I absolutely loved listening to Dean Burgess talk. I learned so much about the state I've lived in my whole life, and he really shined a light on all of the revolutionary things they're doing in the ag sector these days. The fourth industrial revolution is something I've been hearing more and more about, and I can't help but feel excited for what the future holds. Kimberly and I really loved this conversation and we're grateful for the opportunity to have had it. And if anyone wants to know more about the truly revolutionary stuff they're doing in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences at the University of Arizona, look them up, sign up for a degree, please figure out how to build the economy of tomorrow while saving the planet at the same time. This will be our last show of the year. In fact, the last show of our first season of The Torch. Kimberly and I are putting our heads together to produce season two, which will be bigger, more focused, and believe it or not, more consistent next year. I want to extend a final thank you to all of our guests this season. We will definitely be calling you back for round two. Lastly, I want to thank our audience. Have a safe and fun holiday season, and we'll see you all in 2020.